This is Wayland Chow, and welcome to Dispute Resolution, Part A. In this part, we will look at the courts and civil lawsuits. Let's look at the life of a civil lawsuit from beginning to end. A civil lawsuit involves one private person or business suing another private person or business. That's in contrast to a criminal lawsuit where the government, which in Canada we call the Crown, the Crown accuses a person of having committed a criminal offense. So with a civil lawsuit, we always start with some kind of dispute between you know, two, or more, two or more parties. And that dispute can involve what we call a, a tort, which is some kind of wrongful act that has caused injury or loss to another person. We'll talk more about torts in another module. Or it could involve a breach of contract, and we'll talk about contracts in another module as well. So arising from that dispute could be a, an actual lawsuit. So the, the first stage of a lawsuit is called pleadings. So before actually initiating a lawsuit, we have to determine whether or not the applicable limitation period has expired. Limitation period is is a deadline by which a lawsuit has to be initiated. It cannot be initiated once that limitation period has expired. The limitation period in Ontario is generally two years, but it's very important to check out what is the specific limitation period, limitation period that applies to any particular situations because there are exceptions to that two-year rule where the, the limitation period could be shorter or it could be longer than two years. So as long as we're with, we are within the limitation period, the plaintiff, which is the party who is initiating, who is, who is doing the suing, would serve and file a document called a statement of claim. A statement of claim would contain the plaintiff's version of the facts and also state what the plaintiff wants out of the lawsuit. Usually the plaintiff wants the other party, the defendant, to pay money to the plaintiff. After the statement of claim has been served and filed, the, the defendant, which is the other party, the, the person that the plaintiff is suing, would, having, would look at the statement of claim and decide whether or not to, to fight the lawsuit. If they do want to fight the lawsuit, they would prepare a document called a statement of defense, which would set out the defendant's version of the case. If the defendant does not file any statement of defense, the plaintiff basically wins by default and can obtain what's called a default judgment from, from the court. Other, other documents, that, other pleadings that, that, that could arise at this stage uh, could be a counterclaim. So that's where the defendant is claiming an amount from the plaintiff so that they would use, they would put that into a document called a counterclaim. And another document, another pleading could be what's called a reply. So once, once the plaintiff has received a statement of defense from the defendant, if the plaintiff wants to reply to the version of the facts that the defendant has set out in the statement of defense, then the plaintiff can put its response into a reply. The next stage involves a number of different pretrial activities. So the purposes of these pretrial activities is to narrow down the issues so that by the time we, we reach trial, we, can, we know exactly what is in dispute. But a larger, more important, important purpose of these pretrial activities is to encourage uh, the settlement of this, of this lawsuit to avoid having to go forward with a very expensive trial, expensive in the sense that uh, it, it would incur very substantial uh, legal fees. So these pretrial activities include, uh, firstly, an examination for discovery. What that involves is that each party and their lawyers are allowed to ask questions of the other party to find out the details of their case, including what evidence they have. And this also involves each party having to disclose all documents that they have in their possession that is relevant to the case. So by going through this discovery process, uh, we are able to, 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 to determine what are the strengths and weaknesses of each party's case, and therefore 
in encourage a settlement between the two parties. Another pretrial activity could be mediation. Mediation is where the two parties you know, sit down with a, a neutral, a neutral person, which we call a mediator. The mediator tries to find common ground between the two parties in order to try to put together a, a settlement of the case. Now, mediation is a mandatory step uh, for civil cases that are initiated in Toronto, Ottawa, and Windsor. And the final step before actually going to a trial is something called a pretrial conference. A pretrial conference involves the two parties and their lawyers meeting with a judge. So it's not the judge that will hear a trial, but it's a, it's a real judge of, of that court. The judge will be appraised of you know what what was uh, the of the evidence that was obtained through through discovery, and the judge will provide his or her opinion about the strengths and weaknesses of each party's case, and could could also on that basis push the parties towards uh, coming to a settlement in order to avoid trial. Now, if after all that pretrial activity, there is still no settlement of the case, and by the way, you know, more than 95% of cases are settled before reaching trial. Now, if we are unable to, to settle the case and we have to go to trial, uh, a trial can involve, and in civil cases, it's usually a judge alone. The judge hears the case and makes the decision. With, with more serious criminal cases, there's usually a choice between either a judge alone or a judge with a jury. So with a judge, with a jury, the, the matter of uh, guilt or, or innocence is decided by, by the jury. Now in any trial, there is, there is evidence that is presented to the court. Evidence is usually presented by way of witnesses. So it could be what we call ordinary witnesses. So these are people who have firsthand knowledge of what happened in the case. And it can also involve expert witnesses who don't have first-hand knowledge, but expert witnesses such as you know, doctors, uh, engineers, uh, forensic uh, experts, you know, they, they've looked at the evidence in this case and they are testifying about their professional opinion arising from that evidence. When witnesses are called, the lawyer that calls that witness asks questions of that witness. That's called an examination in chief. When that lawyer is done asking questions, the lawyer for the, for the other side, for the, for the opposing party, also has a chance to ask questions of that witness. That's called cross-examination. In pre presenting evidence at trial, there are complex rules of evidence that, that apply to determine whether any particular piece of evidence is admissible or inadmissible. The, the most you know, famous uh, rule of evidence is, is the hearsay rule. The hearsay rule essentially says that a witness cannot testify about something that they heard someone else say. A witness can only testify about what, you know, what, they, you know, what they saw, what they experienced, as opposed to just repeating what someone else has said to them. That's the hearsay rule. Now, in deciding a case, uh, the court will apply a standard of proof. So in a civil case, the plaintiff has to prove its case, like its version of the facts, on a balance of probabilities. So what that means is that based on the evidence pre presented, the plaintiff's version is more than 50% likely to be the, the, the true version versus the defendant's version. With a criminal case, the standard of proof is much higher than just something more than 50%. The Crown has to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. After we have a decision at trial, the next, next stage is an appeal. So this is where the losing party at trial will uh, appeal that decision, or try, at least try to appeal that decision to a higher court. So basically saying, the losing party is saying to the appeal court, 
you know, there was an error made in the trial decision, specifically an error of, of how that court applied the law or interpreted the law, an error of law, in other words. An appeal court will overturn errors of law, but will not appeal errors of fact. In terms of the, what the different appeal courts, a trial decision of the Ontario Superior Court, which is the highest uh, trial court for civil cases, those decisions are appealed to the Ontario Court of Appeal. Ontario Court of Appeal is the highest court in Ontario. And decisions of the Ontario Court of Appeal are appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, which is the highest court in Canada. Now, once appeals are, are exhausted, or even if an appeal doesn't happen, the, the last, last step is called enforcement. So if, if the defendant has, has lost and the court has ordered the defendant to pay money to the plaintiff, that defendant is now called a judgment debtor. And if that judgment debtor does not voluntarily pay the amount that's been ordered, the plaintiff has to take steps to enforce that judgment. So that could involve uh, the plaintiff garnishing the judgment debtor's uh, income, which means if the judgment debtor has a job from which you know, he or she is receiving salary, every time there's a paycheck, the employer will be required to deduct a certain portion of that pay paycheck and pay it over to the court and the court will give it to the plaintiff. Another, another way a judgment can be enforced is to have the court seize and sell the judgment debtor's assets in order to pay down the, the debt that's owing from the lawsuit. One overall point to keep in mind is that most cases never make it to trial. As I mentioned earlier, 95% or more of cases are settled before ever making the trial stage. And a thing to keep in mind is that litigation is uncertain in the sense that you, you can never be 100% sure whether you will win or lose. Second is that the process of a civil lawsuit from beginning to end is, is lengthy. It's not, it's not like on TV where uh, a case is initiated at the beginning of a one hour show and it gets to trial before the show is over. A, a lawsuit can, can go over a period of, uh, of, of years, you know, two, three, four, five or more years sometimes. And you know, because it's lengthy, it's, it's costly. You know, lawyers are expensive. Um, so legal fees, the longer a case is dragged up, legal fees add up. Let's talk about class actions and let, let's look at a real case. So this case involves a gas utility in Ontario called Consumers Gas. So what was happening was that Consumers Gas was charging uh, late payment penalties to its customers. And it was discovered that those penalties were charged at a rate that were, that were illegal or criminal uh, under, under the criminal, criminal Code of Canada. So let's say this particular customer uh, was charged an illegal late penalty uh, of $25. So that customer you know, has a right to sue Consumers Gas to recoup that $25. But the problem is that you know that amount, that $25 amount for that one customer is so small, it's not worth the hassle. Uh, to initiate a lawsuit, and it's just it's just too costly for the customer to uh, to start a lawsuit and and you know hire a lawyer to 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 carry on that that lawsuit. So in most instances, the affected customer will just say you know to hell with it, you know it's not worth it, and and do nothing about that uh, illegal uh, illegal twenty five dollar uh, payment. Now, with the ability to start a class action. We can, instead of focusing on just one customer, we can look at all of the affected customers. So in this case, there were 500,000 affected customers. So those, those customers, so that, that whole group of customers, 
were charged illegal late penalties uh, of $150 million in total. So those customers as a group through a class action can sue Consumers Gas for the whole $150 million. By being able to use a class action to recover the, the late payment penalties, the, the customers have a, a, a practical and useful way of recovering the penalties that they have paid. Now, a thing to keep in mind too is that the, the lawyers representing the customers, so those are the plaintiff's lawyers. You know, they're, they're willing to assist uh, the customers in, in pursuing this lawsuit. Now, and they're very happy about that because once there's a judgment or a settlement of the case, uh, plaintiff's lawyers in class actions are usually paid what's called a contingency fee. So a contingency fee is a fee that is calculated as a percentage of the actual amount that's been recovered in the lawsuit. So that, that rate is usually 25 to 40%. And with a contingency fee arrangement, if no money is recovered, the plaintiff lawyers receive nothing. So they only receive something if there is an amount that's been recovered by way of a judgment or settlement. So if we, if we think about, uh, about uh, this case, let's assume, I don't know what the rate was that was applied in this case in terms of the contingency fee. If we assume that plaintiff, plaintiff's lawyers are paid, uh, let's say the, the lowest, uh, 20, 25%, uh, um, so that would amount to about you know, 30, 38 million dollars that are paid uh, to, to the lawyers uh, out of the total of 150 million dollars. To be able to proceed as a class action, the court has to certify a case as a class action. There are a number of criteria that have to be met before a court will provide that certification. The first criteria, criteria is that there has to be common issues among all class members. With the consumer's gas case, it, all of the affected customers had the same issue regarding the illegal late uh, payment penalties. And there has to be a representative plaintiff. So this is the, the one person who represents, one plaintiff who represents the whole, the whole group, the whole class. And that representative plaintiff has to demonstrate a workable plan for fairly representing all class members' interests. And the third criteria is that there has to be a plan to notify all potential members of, of the class. If there is a mailing list uh, that can be used to contact all of the affected members, uh, what another method of notification is putting ads in in newspapers or, or, or posting something posting something online. And the last criteria is, is that it has to be shown that pursuing the case via a class action is preferable, is the preferable procedure over traditional litigation where, where one affected party sues the company. So having a whole bunch of different lawsuits. So the usual argument there is that, is that it's much more efficient to have one class action instead of thousands of different and separate lawsuits against the company. Let's now look at the court structure for civil lawsuits in Ontario. A civil lawsuit would start at a trial court. The two trial courts are the Ontario Superior Court, which hears claims of over $35,000, and claims under that amount would, would be dealt with by the Small Claims Court. The Small claim, Claims Court is specifically designed to make it easier and quicker and, and cheaper, uh, for, especially for non-lawyers to, to, bring, to bring claims. The, the next level of court up are appeal courts. The two appeal courts in Ontario are the Ontario Court of Appeal and the Ontario Divisional Court. With, with respect to small claims decisions, decisions of the Small Claims Court at trial can be appealed to the Ontario Divisional Court. 
And then the highest appeal court in Ontario is the Ontario Court of Appeal. It hears appeals from the Ontario Superior Court and also the Ontario Divisional Court. And decisions of the Ontario Court of Appeal may be appealed to the highest court in Canada, which is the Supreme Court of Canada. The significance of having what, what we have called higher and lower courts is a legal doctrine called the doctrine of precedent. So under that doctrine, lower courts must follow the legal principles in decisions of higher courts. So what arises from that principle is that you know, all courts in Canada must follow the decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, which is the highest court in Canada. If we look at just Ontario, the lower courts in Ontario would be the Superior Court, Divisional Court, and Small Claims Court. All of those lower courts have to follow the decisions of the Ontario Court of Appeal, which is the highest court in Ontario.